Continuing education knows that at the end, students want to graduate. We believe that there's an option for every student. We are there to help students and serve them. It's, it's our mission. And education is transformational. It changes lives. My name is Katherine Swan and I'm a senior here at the University of Colorado Boulder studying International Affairs and Business. I'm so excited to welcome you to the panel on mental health, staying sane in tough times. As we all know, this past year has spotlighted the need for better mental health resources and today we have some truly phenomenal speakers that have some invaluable lessons on how we can effectively cultivate a safer space for mental health. Without further ado, please give a warm welcome to the panelists and enjoy the panel. Welcome everyone and thank you for joining the CU Boulder Conference on World Affairs virtual panel, Staying Sane, Managing Mental Health and Well-Being in Tough Times. My name is Ben Wagner and I'm happy to be the moderator today. All of the CWA panels are being recorded on YouTube and will be available to watch immediately after each event on the CWA YouTube channel. You may submit questions at any time during the session through the YouTube chat. We invite you to share if you are a CU student especially, you will get priority. And also when you do share questions, please share the locations you are joining us from. Uh, so the structure for this, we will have opening statements from each panelist, and then we'll have a discussion amongst the panelists, and then we'll open it up for Q&A. But again, please feel free to send questions through the YouTube chat uh, throughout the presentation. So our first speaker, is Representative Daphna Michelson Janay. She represents Colorado's House District 30, which stretches from Northern Aurora to rural Adams County, east of Denver International Airport, and back into parts of Thornton and Commerce City, where she resides. Representative Michelson Janay serves on the House Education Committee as the chair of the Public and Behavioral Health Care and Human Services Committee and chair of the Legislative Audit Committee. This is her third term as a Colorado State Representative having been elected for the first time in 2016. Representative Michelson Janae's legislative work has covered broad swaths of policy around the school to prison pipeline, laws around domestic abuse and sexual assault, military and veteran educational opportunities, and primarily focuses on mental health and healthcare access, especially centered around youth. Her big goal for the 2021 session is to push Colorado to be the first state to require insurance companies to cover annual mental health wellness exams for all Coloradans at no cost to the consumers. So please help me welcome Representative Michael Sinjane. Thanks for having me. Um, Dr. Wagner, point of clarification, are you introducing everybody and then getting to the introductions or the introductory remarks? I'll, I'll introduce as they speak so you can go ahead with your opening remarks. Thanks for checking. Okay. All right. Thank you so much. It's such an honor to be with you today and what a pleasure to see Kat at the beginning um, giving an introduction. Kat was my intern and um, we have some really great stories from working together. So thank you, Kat, and thank you, CU, for having me. My story is I got into politics um, specifically because I had a problem and it was a mental health problem. And this mental health problem specifically surrounded my son. When he was in fourth grade, um, after not getting an appropriate IEP or individualized education plan for years, um, he was frustrated and at nine years old attempted to kill himself while at school. This was a very trying time in our family, and I was a person of means, access, and knowledge. This was well before I became elected, but I was very engaged in the school community, et cetera. And I worked every angle I could to get him an appropriate IEP, and I couldn't do it. At the same time, I was volunteering at two of our juvenile detention facilities, uh, Ridgeview Academy for Boys and Betty Marler for Girls. And I noticed specifically amongst the boys that they were very much like my son, twice exceptional, 
so exceptionally gifted with a potential exceptional learning disability, and there wasn't a service or a resource for them to succeed. And all I could think about was with all of my access and privilege and means, I couldn't help my son. It's no wonder that these kids couldn't get help too. And I felt very strongly um, that we should not have incarcerated children. We have children who have mental health problems and we should be addressing those mental health problems so that they can continue to grow up and be good citizens of our community. So I got into office and I figured if I couldn't fix it for my son, I'll fix it for everybody else. And um, my focus for the last four years has been solidly on mental health. And I'm very excited Excited is probably the wrong word, um, but the mental health challenges that COVID presented, I was really working on them before COVID, before we had ever, you know, before the words COVID-19 were in our lexicon. Um, I was trying to figure out, as um, Dr. Wagner mentioned, how to get annual mental health wellness checkups as part of the regular routine of care. Um, why? Good question. I am so glad you asked that question. Let me tell you a story. Back in 1918, we were just on the other side of the Spanish flu. And in Colorado, where I am and where I am lucky to reside and work, there were approximately 300 doctors in the state at that time, which meant that you only went to the doctor if you were exceptionally wealthy or dying. So when the Spanish flu came around, we didn't have the mechanisms or lessons or know-how or knowledge, at least not the general public, of how to care for and identify illnesses in our body. Yes, there were healers. And yes, there were, there were people in communities who had um, centuries of, of healing, um, uh, there's a protocols so that they used on their community. But for the most part, people died because they didn't know when and how best to care for themselves during this time. And it was a global pandemic. Just about two years after that global pandemic, insurance companies thought, you know what, if we teach people how to care for their bodies, maybe it will cost us less and fewer people will die. And they came up with this idea of annual physicals where you would go in every year, see a doctor, the doctor would tell you what's going on with your body, and you would know how to care for yourself and how to prevent illness for the coming year. Well, here we are 100 years and a global pandemic later, and we are still doing mental health services as crisis-only management. Now, sure, some people are doing great and have their therapists, but for the most part, I liken it to this. If you went to your doctor and your doctor said, hey, you've got high blood pressure. Why don't you give me a call when you have a heart attack? That's how our mental health system works for many, many people, for most people in Colorado and in America. So I wanted to see annual mental health wellness exams added into our lexicon because guess what? Here we are again, another global pandemic, 100 years later, isn't it time for us to understand that if we don't take care of our mind, we can't fully take care of our bodies? So it's been a major focus of my life. And then COVID rolled around. Um, we didn't pass the bill last year. I was devastated. And I knew we didn't pass it before COVID rolled around. But once COVID rolled around, I realized we had a really big problem. Because here we were a generation of people who never, never expected that we would have a global pandemic of this scale. I call it an arrogance. So I don't know if any of you like Downton Abbey. It's my all-time favorite show, and I have a lot of favorite shows. But Downton Abbey has, a, a, in the I think it's the first season. No, it can't be the first season. It must be the third season. They have the Spanish flu. And I remember watching that thinking how grateful I am to be alive today where that's not a thing that could happen to me. Arrogance. But I never expected somebody to say, lock yourself in your house isolate from everybody, use Clorox on every surface you can find, wash your clothes the second you wear them, wash your hands 50 times a day, and put on a mask for God's sakes. That wasn't something that I expected to happen in my lifetime. And I know that that's the case for many of my neighbors and their children. And yet we were told you must go behind closed doors. What that has done for people who were in substance use disorder treatment, who are in mental health treatment, 
until we could figure out, I spent hours on the phone trying to figure out telemedicine for things like students from college who had been sent home who were seeing therapists in other states. I mean, there are all sorts of laws that impact your access to therapy. And we had to figure them out like that. We weren't ready for a global pandemic. And I will tell you, we have a lot of work to do with our mental health work. And I'm excited to tell you about some of the stuff we've got going on as we continue the conversation. Thanks for having me. Terrific opening remarks. Thank you for that. And our second speaker is Amy Lopez, PhD, LCSW. She is a licensed clinical social worker and instructor at the University of Colorado Helen and Arthur E. Johnson Depression Center. Dr. Lopez provides individual family couples group therapy and telehealth to adults and children experiencing depression, anxiety, mood difficulties, or life stressors. She specializes in treating personality disorders and is trained in dialectical behavioral therapy, or DBT. Dr. Lopez has also worked in child protection, residential mental health treatment, and the juvenile justice system, both as a social work researcher and faculty. Dr. Lopez's research interests are in the area of social presence and the internet-based mental health treatment, specifically how the therapeutic alliance is impacted by the use of technology. Dr. Lopez also studies happiness and is the author of Search for Awesome, 10 Experiments and the Quest for Happiness. Using theories of positive psychology and well-being, she offers workshops to the community to help people learn to build happier lives. Dr. Lopez. Thank you. Thank you so much for the invitation to be here. Um, and just to go off um, what was said in the previous remarks is this notion of mental health wellness, that that's actually a lot of the happiness work I do is bringing up this concept of how do we think about mental health, not just when we're in crisis. Um, and some of the happiness work is some of my favorite part of the work of the job. But during a pandemic, I think it gets a little bit complicated to say, should we even be talking about happiness when we're in the midst of a pandemic. So rather, I'm going to talk a little bit about what has been happening with patients and what we're hearing from patients and from the community since the pandemic has started. I think first and foremost a year ago, primarily what we were hearing from people was they were anxious, which makes perfect sense. A year ago, we didn't know what was going to happen. We didn't know what was, we didn't know if it was going to be two weeks or six weeks. I don't think any of us predicted that it was going to be a year. Interestingly though, this was only among people who didn't already have anxiety. For people who already had anxiety, they were having a bit of a, I told you so moment to say, this is what anxiety feels like. And now all the rest of you get it. The anxiety stayed for a couple of weeks, but actually by about the beginning of April, we were seeing a shift and more people were reporting depression. And I think that's for a couple of reasons. One, is even just within a couple of weeks, people were starting to realize the loss that this pandemic was causing. There wasn't gonna be graduation, there wasn't gonna be weddings, there weren't gonna be any more outdoor concerts, no summer vacation. And so really the feeling of that loss was pretty significant. I think the second is that in happiness work and in happiness research, doesn't matter what study you look at, the primary variable in people's happiness is relationships. And suddenly we were being told we couldn't have relationships. So those people who were most important to us, we were being told if you care about them, stay away from them. Um, and so people were missing out on those close contacts, but also those day-to-day -day informal contacts, seeing your classmates in school or seeing your coworkers. The third reason though, I think is, is pretty significant is that if you had come to see me prior to the start of the pandemic and said you were struggling with anxiety and depression, I would have said, go be with friends, join a club, get active, get busy, take more time to be out in the world. And in March of 2020, that was really bad advice. And so for the past year, people haven't had access to their regular coping skills. So trying to treat anxiety and depression in the midst of a pandemic is kind of like swimming in the bathtub. All the things that people do to make themselves feel better, they now can't do. Um, which means that people have had to get really creative, including things like telehealth. You know, people were struggling and they couldn't even go see their therapist until we made telehealth a lot more widespread. 
But I think in general, we can talk about some of the creative strategies we've come up with to kind of help people say, how do you feel better, even with a global pandemic happening, and even when your regular coping skills are not available to you? Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Lopez. And swimming in a bathtub, that's a, a great theme to pick up on later as well. And our third finalist is Amanda Marine Shalom, PhD. She is an assistant professor of psychology at Central Connecticut State University, where she teaches and conducts health psychology research. She teaches research methods, psychology of women, diversity within Latino, Latina psychology, introduction to psychology and evaluation research courses. She earned her PhD in psychology from the Graduate Center, City University of New York, master's in psychology from San Diego State University and bachelor's of psychology from University of Nevada, Las Vegas. Dr. Maureen Shalom's research broadly encompasses the psychological adapt adaption processes involved in the adjustment to cancer and the socio-demographic factors that impact these processes, such as cultural values and beliefs. Her current research focuses on cancer health disparities in two areas, stress and coping and cancer survivorship. Her research also aims to understand chronic illness prevention and how cultural values and beliefs in health impact diet and physical activity lifestyle choices and the role of others in these lifestyle choices. Dr. Maureen Shalom. Hi, and thank you for having me. So yes, a lot of my research does focus on health psychology as my background and my training is in health psychology. And within that is health disparity. So I wanna talk on two topics, um, broadly to tie in to representative what she was talking about our health disparities, right? And access to mental health healthcare. So I'm so happy that she's making these policy changes. For instance, I don't know if you know, before the, Amer the American Care Affordable Act, of over 58 million Americans didn't have access to insurance. And then after the passage of that, now we're down to roughly 30 million, which is around 9% of the US population. And within that policy change came access to mental health. Prior to that, a lot of insurance companies could deny you mental health coverage. And even with the American Care Affordable Act, there are still issues, nothing is perfect. Um, but I did give access to more people to mental health care. Once you get, a, once you have insurance, what are some other issues that people run into? Well, how do I pick a therapist? Who is in my network? How close does this person live to me? And there's other barriers when you don't even speak English or maybe English isn't a predominant language that you want therapy in. For instance, in a nationwide survey by the American Psychological Association, the APA, they found that only 5.5% of psychologists said they could provide services in Spanish. And we know about 18% of the current United States population is Latino. And most of Latinos, Hispanics, they do have some familiarity or they speak Spanish. Um, so that's one issue. And it's not just a language barrier. There's also culture competency. So you imagine if only 5.5% of our therapists can provide therapy in Spanish, what about other languages such as French, Cantonese, Chinese, we can go on, right? In addition to that, there's culture competency. Are they trained to work with people from different backgrounds, right? Because once you, once you start therapy, the, part, the hard part is getting that person to come back after that first session. And a lot of people do not come back after that first session. There's a lot of attrition. And then attrition, I mean, not attrition, um, location. Where is this therapist located, right? Before telehealth, who had access to actually see a therapist? In a recent study by the American Journal of Preventative Health, they found that a majority of non-metropolitan counties, 65% did not have a psychiatrist and almost half of them did not even have a psychologist in their area. So imagine how far they would have to drive, could be hours to go to one session. And another disparity is we take it for granted, not everybody has education about what are early signs of depression, what are early signs of anxiety, what do you look for? It's the same thing with if you have children and what are early signs of special needs? Like, how do you know when to seek help before it's too late, right? So that's another disparity. It's education about mental health um, tied in with the stigma. 
right? And some cultures of, you know, is seen as something that might be weak or it's not for us, that's for crazy people with some words around that. And then it tied into health disparities. I have, I wanna give my two cents. I know this is very hard time during the global pandemic. We're all been locked up for the most part for the past year. Um, but there's a couple things that we can do at home um, to help reduce anxiety and symptoms of depression. Keep active. There's so much um, research out there that shows there's being active and you don't need to go to the gym because as we know, we've all become creative and creating ways to be active. Turn on some music and dance in place, right? Go for a walk, um, play with your dog, just keep your brain active. There's the, the natural neurotransmitters and natural endorphins that are released when you do all these things, that's gonna help reduce your depression and anxiety. Sleep, sleep is the bellwether of health. If you're sleeping too long, you're not sleeping enough, that is gonna lead to more anxiety and depression, symptoms of anxiety and depression. And I know it's hard, harder to say than do, eat healthy. You feel what, what you eat, okay? Also find moments to disconnect from media, disconnect from your life, from work, from school, whatever you're doing, find something that you like to do, drawing, reading, something, just to disconnect once in a while throughout the day. Those are moments for you to turn off and recoup. And also I know it's hard to develop social network and maintain them because you know we're not supposed to be with a bunch of people. However, to have phone calls, schedule weekly phone calls with that one person that just brings you to life and that can do so much versus not having that person. So thank you for having me. Thank you. And at this point in the panel, we are gonna shift to a discussion, um, but those of you in the audience, especially CU students, please share your questions in the YouTube chat and also any comments, make sure to um, include your location so we know in the where in the world you're coming from. Um, and and as, you all, as you all may have seen with these opening remarks, uh, this topic is quite, quite broad. We've covered systemic issues uh, and advocacy and also practical tips for mental health. So feel free to ask questions in any of these areas. Um, I wanna follow up with something uh, representative um, Michelson Janae talked about how after the Spanish flu in 1918, there was increased awareness around the need for a yearly physical exam. And it, it sounds like we're kind of hoping, hoping that there's like a similar awakening following the pandemic. And, and this question is really open to all panelists, but what, what positive effects do you see actually coming from the COVID-19 pandemic on society's perception of mental health and then along with that, if you have any analysis of the role of telehealth, both pros and cons have played, uh, maybe we could just discuss the impact of COVID-19 and, and telehealth on our perception of mental health. Well, I'll start from the kind of policy perspective. Um, when we look at suicidality, which is the number one issue that I pay attention to, because I feel like if we can see that suicide rate turn around and start going down, we'll know that something positive is happening. And an annual mental health wellness exam is your time to sit down with, with your therapist um, or whomever you choose, identify and build a relationship and understand what to expect at whatever period of life. So the ideal for this scenario is imagine a woman pregnant with her first child. Um, she not only picks a pediatrician, but she picks a mental health Health professional. She meets with that mental health professional even before she's born, but the baby's born to learn how to best care for this child and how to create safe social and emotional healthy spaces for this child to learn and grow. And every year as the child grows, they have their annual mental health wellness exam right alongside in an ideal setting, their annual physical. Stigma goes away everybody goes for a mental health exam. So that is the ultimate goal of an annual mental health wellness exam. How far ahead of suicidality can we get? And to me, that is the ultimate and the premier. I would just add on to that. I think one of the things we know about therapy is it takes people a long time from when they first start feeling bad to actually reaching out. And so I think the concept of a, of a mental health wellness exam would really reduce that length of time of suffering to catch it sooner. I think it also too, again, on one hand, again, it helps us identify problems before they're too late. I think it's also a little bit reassuring to hear from other people like, actually, you're doing pretty good. Things are going well. So I think it would be beneficial both ways. 
You asked a couple of other questions which flew out of my head. Do you want to re-ask them because they were good questions? Yeah, sure. Um, what have you seen as the advantages and disadvantages of telehealth at this point? So telehealth was the biggest thing that we had to address when COVID started because all of a sudden people were like, I can't go see my therapist. And for the therapy community, and I'll let you speak about what that transition to telehealth was like, but for the patient community, there was this um, significant amount of panic of, I, I can't not see my therapist, especially now, I cannot not see my therapist. And the, like I said, your our college age students were thrown all over the country back to their, whatever their home location was, and their therapist was very likely at their school location. So how do we create laws that allow for those therapists, um, at least in Colorado, to be able to practice across state lines without having to go through the whole rigmarole of red tape? So, you know, I felt like um, uh, telehealth was, was the biggest, amazing, best thing to happen out of COVID in terms of watching community response, because we got people back to therapy pretty quickly, um, which also says something. People weren't afraid to reach out and say, I need help or my kid needs help and, and you know, reach out to me and say, you have to fix the law so they can have the help. And our governor was very willing in Colorado when we came forth, when I came forth and I said, this is a big, huge problem. First of all, I wasn't the only one coming forth, I'm sure, but very quickly thereafter, we had an executive order that allowed for interstate practice, which was tremendous. So I'm, I'm a big fan of, of teletherapy. I do my therapy still by telehealth and, you know, it's actually the only reason I'm able the session. Um, so I'm a, I'm a big fan and would love to hear what um, each of my colleagues' practices were like changing to telehealth during this time. Sure. I'd be happy to speak to that. So at the Depression Center, we actually were in a pretty good shape. We already had an infrastructure for telehealth because we did a fair amount of telehealth prior. So actually within two weeks, we were able to convert about 90% of our patients into full telehealth. Um, with, with not a lot of disruption, which was pretty quickly. Um, again, we were compared to other places that didn't have those systems in place and didn't know what to do. And in fact, had a lot of therapists themselves who were uncomfortable with moving um, to telehealth. Um, however, one of the benefits that came is not only people realizing that they enjoy telehealth, um, in fact, we just did a survey saying, once we reopen, how many of you would like to return? And about 75 to 80% of our patients said we, we actually would prefer to stay with telehealth. They talked about not having to drive across town, not having to find parking, not having to disrupt their day, um, and that they said it actually was better than they expected. The other real benefit though, again, and thank you to Representative Michael, Michaelson and Janae, because um, prior to this year, we couldn't see Medicare patients via telehealth. There were no options to do that. Um, and now that we can, it's opened up, again, accessibility for people around the state. Um, primarily, again, for our elderly who are Medicare patients, they actually like telehealth too. Um, and we were able to get, again, them seen and taken care of. So I, I think, again, the policy and the, the practice go hand in hand in this case. And from, I'm not a practicing therapist, but from an access, I think this is the way we have to go given, you know, there's so many areas you know, I gave the numbers of how many people have an actual psychologist, a licensed psychologist within their area. And it's just, it's not fair, right? It's just going to lead to more health disparities. And you can even think about what about, you know, for children, children, you know, access to, into their schools. I think about my, my son, they, um, they've been having their therapist come in once a week and give them coping skills training. And I'm like, I would love to see something like that in elementary. And so they learn these skills early on. And then they also learn to see those symptoms of anxiety and depression and early on when you and use it early, um, later on in life. Yeah, I, I, the other thing about telehealth in Colorado in particular is we have all of these rural areas that in theory, um, insurance companies are required to have practicing uh, mental health 
practitioners within certain miles of their of their patients. But we know that in actuality, that's not really the case. So we just um, introduced House Bill 1258, which I'm exceptionally excited about um, and couldn't wait to tell you about, which is uh, a response to how do we make sure our students are ready to go back to school in the fall like normal? Um, right now we're still in pandemic times, but there's a possibility that when we open up in fall, we could even be going without masks on. And for our kids who have now been so accustomed to and trained to, um, you have to wear a mask, you have to stay away from people, stay six feet away, your desk can't be next to somebody else, you have to have a plexiglass wall. All of these things have now been um, uh, banged into our kids' heads, or they've been locked in their bedroom for over a year. Um, I was the um, in, I was the chair of the school safety interim committee, and one of the things that we looked at in Colorado, we're unfortunately more often in the news around um, violent incidences in schools. So we have been um, looking at how do we what's the you know root cause, right? And of course, one can say root cause is firearms. We took that off the table so that we could actually work bipartisan on this issue and be able to address it and come forward with legislation. So we focused on the stress, anxiety, PTSD of the reported um, school shooters over the past uh, it's 20 years now, sadly to say. Um, and we looked at that level of stress, anxiety, alienation. Um, these are, are all symptoms that we worried about our kids feeling coming back from COVID. So how do you prep for school? So at the beginning of the session, I'm kind of known for my big wild out there ideas. I call them big BHAGs, big, hairy, audacious goals. So I'm, I'm known for my BHAGs. And so I started coming in and I said, somehow we need to get, and, and uh, this was my original ask, somehow we need to get mental health evaluations and a warm handoff to a provider in a child's network for every school-age child in Colorado. So of course people were like, I get a nice one, Daphna, real good. Yeah, sure. Let's see you do that. And I figured I'm going to have to do this with no money. And I'm going to have to put together a volunteer corps of all the therapists in the state, public, private, everybody who's practicing. And then the governor's office came back and said, how about we do you one better? We have this one-time money, um, which if the legislature can allocate it towards, we'll put $9 million out towards this. And we'll give every school-age child in Colorado who wants one an evaluation plus three free up three or more it could be more but three free mental health sessions with a qualified mental health care provider ideally in the child's insurance network so that there can be a uh, carry through with with extra therapy should need be so imagine this imagine children in colorado taking advantage of this what's the difference between between hundreds of thousands of students taking advantage of mental health sessions and evaluation and preparing for school, preparing for a safety plan, preparing for a, how I'm gonna cope in this environment, talking through all the fears and anxieties that they might have. And then coming to school with the therapist on board and plans for how to handle all the stress and anxiety. I think it's a game changer and I'm exceptionally excited that it's that, that we now see the path, uh, the path forward and we'll hopefully have this stood up before the end of the current school year. Thank you. And, and I wanna ask a question specifically for um, Dr. Maureen Shalom, at least to start. Um, I, I know your research focuses on how sociocultural uh, factors can be a barrier to accessing mental health treatment. And often cultural factors also intersect with economic features like lower socioeconomic status. Um, so if you could start the discussion a little and then open it up to the other panelists as well. Um, what role does culture and socioeconomic status play as a barrier to mental health? And, and what do we need to do to overcome some of those barriers or what is being done maybe already? Um, well, socioeconomic status is a huge factor. Um, if you look at the rates for highest suicide and ideation, um, it's really high against for Latina adolescents. 
And there are many reasons for this that we think it to be. There's intergenerational inter conflict, right? A lot of them are, you know, there's the values of America, there's the values of their family, there's this is adapting to this new environment, right? And then they tend to live in areas of lower SES. So what are we doing to address that? I know that I don't, that's not my area of research, but I know there's people that do try to target that specific group. Um, and it's a lot of the people that are, um, that people that have low SES actually have higher, higher rates of mental health illness um, for obvious reasons, right? And, and those reasons being that they can't even take care of it. If you're basic, if you look at Maslow's hierarchy of needs, which we all know, at the bottom is our basic cycle, um, physiological needs and then our safety. If those basic needs of food, shelter, sleep, um, safety in your own neighborhood are not being met, how are you able to even prioritize your mental health? So that's a huge thing that's been, I think that's another factor of the pandemic. It has put so many people at the bottom of, the, of those needs. And, they're, they, and before when they were had their jobs, right, and they were able to think about their mental health, which they probably had mental health issues before, now they can't even think about them, right? It's like, where am I going to get food? Where is the, the rent going to come from? So SES is a huge factor. And and if you can't, again, take care of those basic needs, it's just going to pile on and pile on until just like your healthcare, right? You get a heart attack, you have a major episode, right? And you don't, and you don't know what to do, or, you know, you get lost in the healthcare system. I would, I would add to that. I think one of the other dilemmas that's related is, um, comparing the way mental health care is carried out to the way typical health care is carried out. So when we think about things like co-pays and time off, that yes, you may be able to afford a $40 co-pay to go see your doctor for a strep visit, but can you afford $40 every single week? Can you get off work for an hour or longer if you have to commute every single week? And unfortunately, that's really the way therapy works, works best is if we can see you consistently and regularly. So but if you can't afford, and we hear that all the time, people say, I can come in once a month because that's the copay I can afford, even if they have insurance. And then to talk about the cultural issues, I, I, I think that's a big thing that America, I think in my opinion, we need to make learning another language mandatory in school. <laughs> and I know they do it in high school where it's a little, in, in, in college where it's a little too late. And I think it's to make America a better society that we can serve more people. And I think, especially if you're in the field of mental health or even physical health, there are so many people, there's so many things that get lost in translation and that those things that get lost in translation impact both physical treatment adherence and mental health treatment adherence. And that's one thing that, you know, prevents people from even seeking a therapist. Like, is there someone in, that speaks their language? Is there someone that understands them? Like there was a time where I was looking for a therapist in New York City. I did not find a therapist that I think that I could connect with. And I'm a very educated person, you know, PhD and everything. I'm like, I could not imagine somebody that's new to this country that has insurance and, you know, may not feel comfortable with the therapist or may not even have access to finding someone that they feel comfortable with. So that's another issue too. Great, thanks for those, those comments. And I'll just add, yeah, higher education and graduate school or clinical programs also need to be more accessible to a wide range of folks so that people can find a therapist who maybe looks like them or shares the same cultural background. Um, some of the questions from the audience are starting to um, blend with our discussion. And I'd, I'd like to introduce um, one or two of them. Um, from Milwaukee, and then a follow-up question from Boulder. Um, if I am not a mental health professional or not a licensed therapist, but I have family members who I want to support in their mental health, how can I help them? And, and kind of following up on that um, from another commenter, um, for family or friends who are against therapy, how can we speak with them to maybe push them in the right direction to, to seek help? Sure, so I'd be happy to actually take that one. So first question is, how do you support somebody who may be having a mental health condition? Um, you know, and one of my favorite uh, ads from all time was actually from the National Institute of Mental Health. And it was 
two guys hanging out, like eating cereal and actually one was like shaving the other. It's kind of a bizarre commercial, but basically it says, how do you support somebody with mental health? And the answer is doing the exact same thing you've always done. Care about them, love them, talk to them, talk about it. Ask them, what do you need? How can I help you? How can I support you? Be willing to be brave and say, you know, are you feeling like hurting yourself? If so, I will help you get the access and the resources you need. But also being willing to say, you know what? Sometimes you may just need a break. Do you want to go for a walk? Do you want to go for a bike ride? Can we go get dinner? Can we watch a movie? Um, so I think that's kind of question one is how do you support somebody with mental health is keep doing what you're already doing. Be a good friend, help them get active. You know, as mentioned before, exercise is huge. So, so be willing to go be active with them. You know, I think the second question, and I can let others weigh in is, um, what, what about people who are opposed to therapy? And I would say people have been doing therapy long before we had therapists. I mean, people talk to friends and family and, you went to your pastor or you went to the priest or the elder. So people have been doing therapy a long time. We just have different formal methods for it. And So I'll jump in. Um, in Colorado, one of the things that we make available at our community mental health centers are programs like Mental Health First Aid. And not everybody loves this program, but I happen to think it's um, pretty phenomenal for helping you learn how to talk to people about mental health or approach people who might be in a crisis or need support. Um, we say at the end of the session, you get a certificate, not a cape. We're not turning into superhero um, social workers and psychologists. We're just giving you uh, a certificate that says you took this first aid class just like physical health first aid. And there's all sorts of different components. You can take youth mental health first aid, which is of course my favorite, which is teaching you how to talk to youth. Um, there's now teen mental health first aid, which is designed to teach teens how to talk to each other. Um, also how to avoid the transference of that stress and depression and anxiety, which is very natural and common. Uh, there's also for police, uh, for firefighters, uh, specifically for men. Uh, so you have all sorts of different options in this kind of mental health first aid world. So reach out to your community mental health center, go on their website, or just go on to mentalhealthfirstaid.org and see what's available in your community. It's an exceptionally um, helpful tool, especially if you have never talked about mental health before. It's, it's not easy and nobody should think that it's easy, but it is critically important. And the more we talk about it, the less stigmatized it is. So if the first couple of conversations are uncomfortable, still go forth for that third and fourth conversation because the more times you have it, the less um, anxiety provoking it's going to be for everybody involved. The other component that in COVID times that, that I think is is a way we've been discussing it. We spent the first year plus of COVID desperately trying to find a vaccine. And for many people, the second that vaccine was available, they ran out and gave their arms because they wanted access to the vaccine. I know I took it the first, uh, first second it was available to me. We do have the vaccine for depression and anxiety and suicidality, and it's called therapy. And perhaps if we take that vaccine and we start taking it in advance instead of waiting till we're in crisis, or if we're already in crisis, okay, that's fine. Please, let's just reach out. Let's not make that crisis worth, worse. You've got your vaccine. So I think there's um, you know, a way to talk about it that fits with the times as well. To jump off what um, Dr. Lopez mentioned, how we've all have had therapy for a while. We just call it something else, right? Um, the personal, I went to, when I was an undergrad, I had therapy sessions, 15 sessions. And I remember that at the end of the sessions, the therapist said, you're fine. Find somebody that you can trust and talk to. That's all you need. And a lot of times that's all we need. Someone to get that anxiety, all of, all the stuff that's going on, just someone to, it's, it's cathartic to talk to somebody and People take it for granted. Not everybody has that person that a confident that they can talk to, can be non-biased. And that's why we go to therapy too, right? You have someone, you have things that protect you from them sharing your business, but it's someone that's not unbiased and not judging you. Find that one person that can be that person. Yeah. 
that you can go to and have their ear. Well, that's great. And uh, we have another question um, from Louisville, um, kind of asking if one of the barriers is our for-profit um, health insurance system and is asking the panelists if something like universal health care or Medicare for all, um, if, if that would help people access mental health treatment. Um, and, and then just to piggyback on that, there was another question about whether um, the difficulty of having insurance carriers pay for telehealth is a state or federal issue. So kind of thinking broadly about insurance policy and national health care. I'll talk to you from the kind of policy perspective um, first. And things to remember, Medicare is federal and Medicaid is state. So when we think about how things are worked out, they can happen at either level. But if we're making a Medicaid policy for telehealth, that's a state by state issue. However, the federal government can, as they did in the ACA, say that this is a required part of insurance coverage is access to teletherapy at the same reimbursable rate, that's really important, at the same reimbursable rate as in-person therapy. Um, there, that was a big part of the conversation because telehealth reimbursement rates for the providers are in the toilet. And we had to specifically make sure that they were compensated at an appropriate level. So the question to whether universal healthcare um, or something akin to it would be better, well, that's, that's, that's an interesting question. And it all depends on how that universal healthcare is set up. Do we set up a universal healthcare system whereby you have X amount or unlimited amounts, which is really ideal, of therapeutic interventions, including one annual mental health wellness exam with no copay and coinsurance, which is what I'm pushing for. And I'm pushing for it on the federal level as well, but I work on the state level. So, you know, I can pass it on the state level. I have to beg somebody else to pass it on the federal level. Um, so if we are able to put together a good system that recognizes the critical importance of mental health wellness as opposed to physical wellness, yes, I think it would be um, a wonderful system. I think it would be easier to access and navigate. Um, and I think more people would be covered and also have a little bit, you know, for, for communities, I work a lot with immigrant and refugee populations. In my district, I have the greatest density of immigrant, refugee, and poverty in the state. And in those immigrant communities, there is still a lot, a lot of stigma around therapy. But if we start having this access where therapy is this normal part of your um, medical coverage, I think it'll go a really long way to making sure that all people have access to what they need. Hi, Angela. Just to also say to keep in mind that mental health doesn't have to be you drive across town and you go sit in somebody's office, that we can have mental health work in the schools. We can have them in those communities. You know, talking about those refugee or immigrant communities, there, there's no reason we can't send somebody to go work with them and do group. And those, the, the big problem is a lot of those are not reimbursable activities under our current insurance structure. So I think it's more than just, is it universal health care? But I think there really needs to be a reworking and thinking, like I said, not only about, you know, the consistency with which people come, but also where's the site? Where can we provide services? And to add to that, um, I know Dr. Wagner spoke on it earlier, um, was we have a limited amount of licensed mental health professionals in the United States. The current number is there, there are about 34 psychologists per 100,000 people. 34 psychologists per 100,000 people in the United States. And there's a lot of issues for that, right? We talk about grad school. It's very hard to get into grad school and there's structural issues. We get systematic structures getting into grad school such as GRE scores, et cetera. Um, and it's teaching people and it's accessing, you know, getting people to join grad school, right? Even if it's just, a, you know, a master's degree because you can provide you know, mental health, what's a master's degree, you know, a PhD is not for everyone, dissertation writing is not for everyone. So, and he's laughing because <laughs> we we're all like traumatized from that process. Um, but teaching people like you don't have to get a PhD to be a mental health professional and then teaching people you can get a master's afterwards, encouraging more people to go on and get a degree, you know, 
a post of post baccalaureate. Oh, that's just wonderful. And just a warning, we have about 10 more minutes. So if you have any questions in the audience, again, share your location and type in the question. Um, another question kind of building off this topic is what can we learn from uh, how other countries or societies or cultures address me mental health? That's a big one. And while some of you think of an answer, I will say off the top of my head, um, Italy has some uh, programs for helping people who live with schizophrenia not be homeless by having um, families volunteer to be a host family for, for somebody to actually live with them um, if they have like an extra room in their apartment. Um, but I, I think stigma exists in a lot of nations or cultures. Um, panelists, any ideas? That's a great question. I'll, I'll tell you, you know, when we look for solutions um, for specifically mental health on the legislative side of things, we're looking at the 50 states. We're not looking um, outside and perhaps we should. And maybe that's an incredible suggestion, because quite frankly, when we look at how we deal with incarceration, we very often look outside of the United States because the United States does a very poor job of incarceration, very, very poor job. Um, so we, we look at the Netherlands, et cetera, and that's you know, possibly a place where we could look at mental health because they're always the happiest of nations when uh, we're seeing the, the results come in. But I think that, you know, when we look at America and we look at the problems that we are having, some of them are very unique. Many countries do have universal health care of some sort. Many countries do have free college. Many countries do have things that we don't have, which I think impact our overall mental and physical health. So there's there's a lot to unpack um, and definitely I'd be up for a field trip to all the countries and we can figure out how they're doing it and see what we can bring back home. And I think a lot of it again ties to stigma and we have to make it okay, just like going to get your annual physical exam, your annual OBGYN exam. I mean, like I gotta go get my mental health exam. And again, comes back to how many people do we actually have to provide these exams? We can say we want to provide these exams, so who's going to provide them, right? Um, I was thinking, so I teach a class called Diversity Within Latino Psychology, and we go over all the different Latin American countries, part of it, and what does mental health look in there? Argentina has the highest percentage per capita of psychologists to people. And I have a, I have a, a, a colleague that's Argentinian, and she had made a joke that they all have a therapist and everyone is, is just normal. You know, it's like, yeah, I gotta go see my therapist. And it's like a thing that they just do. So again, it comes again to just making it part of our culture and, you know, they're removing that stigma for it and also giving it access to everyone, not just people with good health insurance, people from middle-class um, economic status and higher economic statuses. Okay, great. Um, and, and there's some general comments asking for the panel to go longer. Um, <laughs> I'm willing. Uh, so yeah, mm -hmm. again, if you have questions, type them in the chat. Um, yeah, I, I, I want to bring up the topic of addiction because it seems like it's kind of floating in the room connected to a lot of these issues. So how do you all see how mental health and addiction uh, interact? And, and currently, what kind of barriers are there to getting addiction treatment and addressing that stigma as well. So right now, the way the systems are set up is that mental health treatment and substance abuse treatment are really categorized as two separate tracks. In fact, even mental health professionals, you're kind of trained, either you do substance abuse or you don't. Um, there's not a lot of crossover. And even though they tie in that a lot of people will say, you know, again, part of the reason I use substances is to manage my mental health or vice versa, people who may have, say, like a bipolar disorder and they're, they have some impulse control issues that the, the substance abuse ties in, that we don't have a great integrated system. Um, and, and I think that's one of the places to start, even again, back to education of therapists um, and psychologists around how, how do we not treat these as two unique issues? I think it also then gets into the payment structure as well, is that sometimes the payments are different to, and, and what's covered by insurance. Yeah, from a policy level, um, uh, substance use disorder treatment 
is the, the quintessential redheaded stepchild. Um, they're constantly fighting at the table for their share of the pie. And, and um, uh, like Dr. Lopez said, you know, it, there's this kind of this wall in between these two um, parts of behavioral health. Last year, for the first time known to man in the Colorado legislature, we ran a substance use disorder treatment and a mental health treatment bill together. And it was like, wow, like, what an idea, what a concept, even though we're all kind of talking about it, but let's maybe put some legislation together. Um, this year, we're working on a very significant bill because when Colorado started um, being concerned that we weren't going to be able to bring in the tax revenue to run the state, a lot of money, $3 billion, was clawed back from the budget. And where do you think that money came from? Mental health and substance use disorder treatment dollars. So right now we're running a, a very large bill, a very expensive bill, unusual for Colorado, unusually expensive for Colorado because of the way our tax system works, to refund those programs whose money got clawed back and to grow them because we have seen what this pandemic has done to people who are in treatment. You know, many people who were successfully clean for a long time were then locked in their homes with all their alcohol or their, their, their friend's alcohol or their partner's alcohol, um, couldn't get to their substance use disorder treatment program um, telehealth in the beginning was too scary for them. You know, there were so many factors that impacted substance use disorder treatment that at this point, we have a really big problem on our hands. And we had a really big problem on our hands prior to the pandemic. So we're trying to run at least one a year, substance use disorder treatment and mental health together, also known as behavioral health care bill, um, so that we can start thinking that way from a um, policy perspective, and hopefully the community who's already thinking that way will fall into play with us and we can start bringing them closer together. And I, to add just to, from a prevention perspective um, and stress coping researcher, substance abuse is a way of coping with something, right? And how can we prevent and how can we teach people to cope with stress in more adaptive ways, right? Because the pandemic has created more, has created uh, alcohol abuse, right? Has created abuse of other substances that are not good for you to cope with the stress of the pandemic. And how do we teach at an early age and keep teaching, how do you to cope more adaptively with stress when we do, when we do get in these circumstances? Because not all of us, you know, when we do encounter stuff like the pandemic, turn to alcohol or turn to drugs. And what can we do? What do we know about those people? And how can what can we take that knowledge and create interventions to treat to train people to be adaptive cultures? Well, that's great. And and are you all going for a little longer per the audience request? Great. Um, there was a question about our aging population and older adults who live in assisted living and what about their mental health? Um, and I imagine alongside that is issues of like isolation from COVID-19 for the aging population. Um, any, any comments from our panelists about that particular population? Yeah, I think, you know, it, especially in the pandemic, there were lots of things with our elderly and aging population that were that were scary. I mean, one is that we knew that it, it affected them more significantly. Two is that, again, a lot of them didn't have access or weren't as comfortable with technology the way maybe some of our younger populations were. And so being able to stay connected via FaceTime or Zoom or, or anything really beyond the telephone really created a lot of isolation. I think even as mental health providers, we had a really hard time getting access and getting into some of the facilities to provide mental health care because they really were, again, protecting them both physically, but again, even the idea of doing a, um, you know, a telehealth visit was overwhelming. Like I said, we've seen that a lot of our older patients have, well, they like telehealth, that they do like it, um, but we still have a significant population who really would like to be able to see their provider in person. And again, it because of their increased risk, it's been a lot more challenging to be able to do that. 
I think we've also seen um, consistently, and this was pre-pandemic, the second highest rate of suicide amongst population groups is our senior population. And there's a, a lot to unpack there. And part of what we unpack there is stigma. That's likely to be the population with the highest levels of stigma because they, they grew up in a time where we didn't talk about that, just the same way we didn't talk about cancer. Um, so working with that community to create and what Dr. Lopez has suggested about group-centered activities um, in terms of therapeutic interventions are really ideal, especially if they're living in congregate care, because that helps them also make relationships beyond just the therapeutic intervention. And we know that those relationships are absolutely critical um, at, at every stage of life, but particularly at, at the later stages of life when solitude is, is a killer. Great responses. And it looks like we have a time for another question or two. So again, type in the YouTube chat, please share your location. Um, another question from Milwaukee, Wisconsin. What is the biggest hurdle we must overcome as a society in order to normalize getting help for mental health? And why has this been such a struggle in comparison to other aspects of medicine? So I think one of the issues related to stigma is that, you know, mental illness is one of those um, invisible disabilities. And in fact, people work really hard to overcome it. And I think, again, it, there was a lot of belief system of that it's not the same, that, you know, if you just work hard enough that your depression will go away, rather than kind of this concept of if you can't see well, you put glasses on. You know, we don't treat depression and anxiety that same way. You may need therapy and medication just because that's the way your brain and body work. Um, so as far as where do we go, I mean, I think there have been some movements. I think it is getting a lot more normalized. You know, there are actually like Facebook pages. They're like things my therapist told me. Um, we've seen high profile kind of celebrities talking about their experiences um, with both their mental health conditions and with going to therapy. And I think, again, I think there's some, some space for that to become more typical, more normal, which will help with the stigma. I agree. I think it's becoming more normalized through even advertisements. I don't know, there's a lot of advertisements for telehealth. And another sign that it's becoming more normalized is what is being shown on TV. If you look a lot of the shows, they're talking about social justice, they're talking about mental health, they're talking. So when you when it hits national ABC, NBC shows, then you know it's getting somebody's attention. And I think it's getting the attention of of the of the of the of the, of the, of the nation. And the fact like just seeing my just my own experience with my own child and like the school having this therapist and giving these sessions, I'm like, wow, I, I, I have never got that in elementary, you know, <laughs> as a therapist to come talk to us and tell us how to deal with our emotions. And I think that's a step in the right direction. It's like, but how do we get that to the masses? And I think it comes down to, it comes down to money. How much does it cost? And therapists, we went to school for a while, right? We deserve to be compensated for our time. And, and that's the thing with billing, right? They don't wanna pay us what we're worth per hour to do therapy in a community study or do therapy in these different settings. And that's unfortunately, that's what it really comes down to. It's like, what can they pay the less, the least possible to get mental health to people? And then there's also the policy um, angle where I wanna, go off of what Dr. Marin Shalom said, that the fourth estate is what we call the media, um, is a really quintessential part of this story. So when we do these pieces of legislation, and I've been doing mental health legislation since my very first day in the legislature, and one channel or another will carry the story of that legislation, and then we get all sorts of calls, both angry and, and in support of um, the type of legislation we're doing. And quite frankly, I don't care if the email is angry or if the email is happy and supportive. We are having a conversation about mental health. And the more we talk about it, the more we're going to normalize it. And so I make it a point, um, if you heard me say it already on this panel, to talk about my own therapy, uh, because I think that it's, that it's only fair that people understand that 
you know, you know, we, we talk about in, invisible disabilities, um, as Dr. Lopez brought up, I have major depressive disorder, and that is a very serious mental health condition that can be managed. And life can be wonderful. Um, and it can be pretty crappy at times as well. But understanding that there's a pathway for you to be whoever you want to be, even with major depressive disorder or any other mental health condition, it's a critical part of the conversation. So I'm so grateful for the news media um, who is covering like crazy these uh, current pieces of legislation and the ones we've done in the past. Um, I'm so grateful for television shows that talk about therapy or our therapy style. Um, I can't remember the name of that fam modern family. That's like basically everybody sitting on a couch and talking to the therapist. I think that that's awesome. Um, and also when we talk about our school-based uh, therapy, one of the reasons we did the big bill that I talked about to give each child three mental health sessions prior to getting into school is because our school-based mental health centers are overrun. And I don't know if it's parents don't understand or hear or have time to see or have money or know how, but our kids are crying out for help. So the goal with our three mental health sessions and a warm handoff to a mental health provider in your network is so that the school-based health centers can work with all the kids who didn't have that opportunity. We have to make space so that those who absolutely need that care in school can get it. And those who are, are fortunate enough to have even Medicaid or insurance because um, Medicaid is part of this program, then they can have a provider in their network and, and develop that relationship that is so critical for success, that ongoing care that one needs. I think you bring up an important point though that hasn't been mentioned that I think one of the barriers is people don't know where to start. They don't know where to find a therapist. They don't know what their insurance covers. They don't know what to look for, what would make a good therapist. Um, so I think, I think that's the other Part when we talk about stigmas, we need to talk about how how do you find a therapist, um, and what are the steps. So I'm pulling up a website, and you stop talking too fast um, for Colorado's Behavioral Health Care Ombudsman, and I'm going to drop it in to the chat, and maybe it can be sent over to wherever that needs to be. Um, but we created the Office of the, the Behavioral Healthcare Ombudsman, and hopefully we're going to get some extra funding because it's a little bit underfunded. Um, so if you don't get help right away, please do call back. And they're there to help you when you hit a wall. Like somebody told you your insurance doesn't cover mental health care. That's illegal in Colorado. You have to cover mental health care in Colorado. So reach out to the Behavioral Health Care Ombudsman. Um, and if you're not in Colorado, uh, I imagine other states have similar type programs. We stood up the Behavioral Health Care Ombudsman's office in 18. We, we passed the legislation in 17, so it's, it's still relatively new. Um, but there are people out there whose only jobs are to help you get therapy. And in Colorado, the other thing that you can do, and, and I know that you can do this um, across the country, and I'm sorry I didn't put this in the chat before now because I'm not doing my job. You see how I'm like buying myself time? Um, is the Christ, Colorado Crisis Services. Um, and you, there is an 800 number for Colorado Crisis Services, and there's an 800 number for National Crisis Services. But Colorado Crisis Services in particular, if you're feeling really antsy and angsty and you need help, and I'm not saying you're feeling like you're done with this world, just feeling like you just need help and you need it really pretty soon, call or text Colorado Crisis Services. Um, you can text the word TALK to 38255 and they will connect you with somebody who can help you. Someone who will talk you to you right now and then they will work to connect you to somebody for ongoing care. There is help out there. Take advantage of it to the best of your abilities. Great. I think we have time for one more question, and some of these resources uh, will hopefully get their way into the YouTube chat. Another one is just finding the National Alliance on Mental Illness, or NAMI, as well as the Suicide Prevention Line number that's readily available through Google. 
Um, so final question, um, sometimes therapy sessions end with the homework assignment. I'm sure a lot of our audience members want to keep learning more. So if you had one book or one website that you would encourage folks to go um, pick up or access in order to learn more about this topic and continue their journey, what would it be? You know, I think that's right. you Go ahead. I think that's hard just because so many people are coming at this with so many different kinds of problems. But if people want to know what the experience of therapy is like, there's a book just out, and I'm not going to know the author, um, but it says you should talk to someone. Um, and it's actually her experience, both being a therapist and then going to her own therapy at the same time. Um, so it, that just talks more about the therapy experience. But there are a ton of good resources, books, websites available. Um, but again, this is kind of where you, you want to see a therapist so you can figure out what treatment is right for you and what will work for your condition and what's a good match for your personality style. A good, and also be careful where you get your information online. You want a reputable website. Um, the APA website, the American Psychological Association website, they have resources to every topic you can think of on their website. You know, the web, um, CDC is a good website. So anything that ends with .org is safe. So be very cautious in where you're trying to get guidance on how to get mental health and go that way. And I would ask you to watch, I'm gonna drop it in the um, thing, although it doesn't have to be that long. So whoever's copying it, just go up to 1258. You don't need all the stuff on the end. Um, so the legislature's website is an amazing place to go if you wanna be an advocate. And we desperately need advocates in the mental health arena. If you wanna stand up and testify for a piece of legislation that says, hey, we wanna help Colorado's kids, April 20th, my house bill 1258 is going to be in um, committee. So we would invite you um, in Colorado, sorry, I don't mean to say, you know, I need Coloradans for this one, um, but do check your legislature's website. We had someone from Louisville, and I know my friend is a rep state representative in Kentucky, and she has been pushing my house bill uh, to create annual mental health wellness exams in, in Kentucky. Um, and she could definitely use some support. So if you think that annual mental health wellness exams sound like a good idea and you're in Kentucky, reach out to Rachel Roberts in the, in the Kentucky legislature and go to your state legislature and just see what's going on. Um, all, all the legislatures have websites, some are better than others, and you can just see what legislation they're doing in the mental health arena and get behind that legislator or legislators who are working in that arena and bring them your ideas. Uh, what are the things that you're seeing that's working? What are the things that you're seeing that's not? If you're a provider, if you're a, if you're a patient, uh, what are the barriers to care? You bring those to your legislature and they will start to work on them, but they have to hear from you, their constituents. So please reach out. And if you want to make big, huge change that's going to take a long, long time, you can reach out to your federal delegation. Um, so I would do those simultaneously, but have a lot of patience with the federal delegation because it takes a lot more time to pass legislation there um, and start on your state level where you can actually move something fairly quickly. Wonderful. And any closing comments for other two panelists or any of our panelists before we close up today? I'll just say so many ways to advocate, whether it's talking to your local legislators or getting therapy yourself and talking about it with your friends and family or learning and becoming a therapist. So I'm just really honored to have been here with all three of you today virtually um, to have this discussion. I'm really glad that we had such an engaged um, audience. So thank you again for joining us today. And a special thank you to our speakers who volunteered their time. Uh, if you'd like to support them or learn more about their work, you can find their books, podcasts, and social media accounts linked on the CWA website. And remember, the CWA relies on the generosity of people like you to make this event possible. Please consider making a gift to the CWA, which can also be done on the CWA website. That's colorado.edu slash CWA. And today is the last day of the CWA 2021, but catch up on the events you missed on the CWA YouTube channel. And uh, thank you again, everyone, for joining us.
Have a great day.